know, we get to those places in life where we think, how in the world are we going to do this? Or how am I going to do this? Or, or you know, how is this going to happen? Or, you know, and, and, and sometimes we just throw our hands up and go, I just, man, I just don't get it. You know, sometimes you got to have faith. And sometimes you just got to trust God and you have to put that into action. But then there's sometimes when we're, you know, in life and we get to this place in life where we think, man, what is my purpose anyways? Anybody ever, you know, and you don't have to raise your hand, but, you know, I've even felt that way. And I'm, sometimes we even feel that way multiple times during our life. God, what's my purpose? Why am I even here? What am I even supposed to be doing? How can I make a difference? Am I even supposed to make a difference? Sometimes we say, well, man, I'm nobody special. You know, because sometimes we talk about certain people that do big things, or they accomplish this, or they accomplish that, and it's kind of a larger-than-life thing, and we get the feeling like, man, that's just, that's awesome, and they're great, and they're cool, but that's not me. You know, I'm just this, you know, little old person that, you know, I don't, I don't do anything big, and man, I've, I've got a past, and I've made mistakes, and I've done this, and, and I don't even know if I have a purpose. But I want to challenge you today through this teaching, and I want you to know from the bottom of my heart that every single person that sits in this building today, you have a purpose. It is a God-designed purpose. You're special. You're special. God created you to be you and nobody else. God gave you the characteristics and the traits that you have for a reason. In fact, the Bible says he created you to be a masterpiece. A masterpiece. And he's got specifically designed plans and purposes for for each and every one of our lives if we will just begin to focus on those completely and be determined to see those through. There was a man that started a hobby of writing to famous philosophers and scientists and authors. And one time he, he wrote to them and he asked this very simple question, what is the purpose of life? The responses that he got back were very depressing at best. Some of these names you may know, and some of them you may not. But, but these are people that, 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 you know, with these names that are, are famous authors or scientists or philosophers or whoever. And so, you know, they, they actually did write him back. And one's name is Isaac Asimov. And he said, as far as I can see, there is no purpose to life. Carl Jung, the famous Austrian psychiatrist, he wrote, I don't know what the meaning or the purpose of life is. But it looks like as if there were something meant by it. Arthur Clarke, who wrote the the book 2001, he said, I'm afraid I have no concrete ideas of the purpose of life. Thomas Nagel, he wrote, I'm afraid the meaning of life still eludes me. And the, the famous author Joseph Heller wrote, I have no answers to the meaning of life, and I no longer want to search for any. Wow. And I don't, to get to the place in life where I don't want to search out what I'm supposed to do has to be one of the loneliest places. I don't know if I've ever gotten completely to that point. But I would say that I've been close. And and maybe many of you have been close. Or maybe you're here today and you're at that point. You're like, really, what is the point? Where am I at in this whole thing? A poet, David White, wrote, I don't want to have written on my tombstone when finally people struggle through the weeds, pull back the moss, and read the inscription that says he made his car payments. He made his car payments. Did you know some people, that's just life, to wake up, go to work, pay their bills, go home, go to bed, And hit redo. Jesus said he came to give abundant life. Not boring life. Not life without meaning. Abundant life. Now to to, to walk in that and to live in that abundant life and that life of purpose, it's going to take some things. For many of us, it takes, you know, change, which is hard anyways. None of us like change. Maybe some of us like change a little more than others, but regardless, it's, it's tough, it's hard, but we all have a purpose. Today's story comes from chapter 21 in the story, and it's about uh, a man named Nehemiah. And in 587 BC, the Babylonians had invaded and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. 
And the temple that was there, God's house, it was destroyed um, during this time. And some 80 years later, the Jews returned to Jerusalem. But of course, things didn't look good. And the temple, you know, it, it was still marred and it was still destroyed and hadn't been maintained. And I mean, it was just in a bad, bad way. Sacrifices had ceased. The worship of God had pretty much come to a halt. The Jews had adopted the lifestyle and culture of the surrounding nations. And the spiritual and social conditions in Jerusalem were deplorable. But there was one man, and his name was Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was about to discover and live out God's purpose in his life. And so this morning, through this story, and, and maybe some of these things may sound similar, and, but some of this is going to be just a little bit different to you. But this morning, I want us to look at three things. If you want to live a life of purpose... Three things that we have to focus on. Number one, very simply, you have to focus on a concern. You need to focus on a concern. Or, or another word in, that we could throw in there for concern is burden. Focusing actually on that burden. A life of purpose always begins with the concern that God has given you. Let's, let's jump into Nehemiah chapter 1. And in verse 1 it says, In late autumn of the 20th year of the king's reign... I was at the fortress of Susa. Han and I, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had survived the captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well. For those who return to the province of Judah, they're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been burned. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. This concern or this burden that God just gave him, it wasn't just a passing thought. See, when we talk about concerns or burdens, you know, I know sometimes we see something and it may, it may trigger something inside of our heart and it may, you know, it may tug at us just a little bit. And, but, but, you know, sometimes a lot of those things, we'll see them, they'll last for a couple days and, and then they'll just kind of, float away as fast as they came in. But a true concern and a true burden is something that just will not go away. Once it's planted, I mean, it is there. And, and I mean, you think about it, you know, all throughout the day when you wake up and, and when you're at work and, and when you go to bed and it just consumes who you are. God's purpose for you will always begin as a God-given concern. A God-given concern. Nehemiah's concern was over his people, it was over Jerusalem, couldn't get it out of his mind, it was his main focus. He thought about it all the time. So you'll hear something or see something that gets your attention, a thought that re 